double European champion, 13-time British champion, double Olympian, Commonwealth and world silver medalist. That's just some of the accolades Lizzie Simmons has to her name. The 28-year-old is one of Britain's most successful swimmers and retired from the sport back in July 2018. But things have been far from simple since then. When you've lived most of your life as an elite athlete, chasing targets and aiming to go as fast as you can is a massive void to fill when you take it away. That's proved to be particularly challenging for Lizzie as she struggled to come to terms with her loss of identity. Not only that, but the current vice chair of the BOA Athletes Commission also admits to struggling with her emotions at competitions. Too often, she would believe her self-worth as a person was wrapped up and intertwined with her success in the pool. If you fail to perform, as you'd hope, that would have catastrophic consequences. In this feature interview with Lizzie, we talk all about her life after sport, the identity crisis, the battle with self-worth, and also the challenges of seeing your body change once you retire from elite sport. But through the hardship, the 28-year-old has learnt a lot, and she is ready to pass on her knowledge to the next generation. Lizzie, it is a warm welcome to the podcast and thank you so much for coming on to our show. How are you at the moment uh, in the summer holidays? I'm very well, thank you. Summer holidays makes it sound like being at school. Um, yeah, no, so it's it's all going really well. Um, yeah, just in, enjoying the enjoying the warm weather, long may it last, although I think it's on its way out now. Um, and yeah, good to, good to be on the podcast, good to chat. Yeah, exactly. Definitely make use of the warm weather because it won't last all that long. Um, no. Turning then to swimming and your career, uh, it's obviously been a highly successful one as well. Two Olympic Games, fourth in the 200 metre backstroke at London 2012, double European champion, Commonwealth silver medalist, 13 time British champion. The list could go on and it does go on, um, but I'm going to start with the topic of identity, um, primarily because that's something you've blogged a lot about recently. Um, you retired in 2018 and since then I suppose it's been maybe a challenge to kind of get to grips with who you are now. Um, how difficult has that been to sort of cope with and work that out following your retirement last year? Yeah definitely it's a, it's a really good question and it comes up a lot when um, talk to athletes who are coming out of sport, especially athletes who have spent, uh, you know, had such a kind of long career that I did. Um, you know, I was I was training at a really high level, at an elite level, really, from the age of thirteen, doing kind of sixty kilometres a week in the pool. So my my identity ever since I was, you know, mid teens was very much I am an athlete, I am an elite athlete, I am an Olympian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it was very much tied up in my performance and my sport. And that's okay. You don't really think about it when you're in sport but obviously sport doesn't last forever so when an athlete inevitably comes to the end of their career like I did last year it was something that is and continues to be quite a big stumbling block for lots of athletes and um, you hear about athletes really feeling that kind of identity loss when they come out of sport and they can no longer say I am an athlete I am an Olympian etc um, and, and it, it was tricky for me as well I think when I actually retired for the first two or three months I just felt like I was on a massive holiday so that was brilliant um, but after that I really did start to struggle with the identity thing and, and start to think you know who am I what's my purpose um, you know, struggled with motivation as well because I'd had such a kind of defined singular purpose for such a long time that I felt very focused on what I was doing in my sport and the objectives I was trying to achieve and the goals that I had in sport. And then suddenly I had, you know, a real vast range of goals in lots and lots of different things, but I couldn't quite figure out who I was and what I was doing. And it took quite a lot of time, probably around six months for me to, to really start to come to terms with that. Um, and, and over the past 18 months or, so, or since I did retire, it has been a kind of coming to terms situation. Um, and I do feel like now I have come to terms with it. And I feel like now I've accepted that actually I don't need to find one singular, really defined identity again. Um, and actually, that it's OK to have lots of different ident identities. So um, I do various different things. I've got 
six or seven different roles um, in various different industries at the moment. And actually, they're really exciting and I have different goals and different aspirations in all of those things. And I have different identities in all of those different things as well. And it's something that's very different to what I've, I've experienced as an athlete. Um, but it's actually really exciting. But it is a big change to come to terms with. Um, and I think I, I have written a lot about identity and especially athletes um, having a bit of a think about their identity whilst they're still competing so that they don't get to the point where they feel like they drop off the edge of a cliff when they stop. Um, and I think that's so important for athletes to do because I think it's very easy to say, I am defined entirely by my sport, I'm defined by my performance, by my medals, by my the time on the stopwatch or the score on the scoreboard. And actually, there's so much more to athletes. They, they do so much more um, you know, outside their athletic career, they they are so much more than their performance, than the time on the clock or the medals they have or the records that they hold. And I think it's so important to encourage athletes to start thinking about who who am I? What you know? What do I bring to this world? What's my purpose? What really you know really kind of floats my boat, makes me tick, makes me excited about things outside of my sport. And then actually, when you get to the end of your career, if you've got a fairly stable kind of um, you know, knowledge of who you are and what you're doing, then there's a bit of le- less kind of risk of really feeling that huge loss when you get to the end of your career. Um, so I think, yeah, it's it's something that I feel quite passionate about helping educate athletes about the fact that it's, you know, it's it's fine to be motivated and, and invested so much as you are in your sport because that's sport and that's elite sport and that's how, you know, most athletes become very good at what they're doing because of that single-minded focus and because they're able to, to um, kind of dedicate so much time and effort and energy to what they're doing. But actually, it's really important to at least think about what else you might want to do, what else that, you know, makes you excited, what else motivates you in life, what else you feel passionate about and start to investigate those other options as well. Um, And I think as a as a final kind of thing on identity as well, it was really important for me to acknowledge coming out of a sporting career where, you know, my identity was very much tied up in being an athlete. And I think you often hear of athletes talking about feeling grief when they come out of sport um, and go through a a major transition and I'm sure that's the same in in other industries as well I'm sure there are same the similar kind of um, reactions from people leaving the military and things like that Um, but it really is a it's a very odd thing to feel because you know you know you know logically you've not lost anybody or anything particularly but you do feel a certain sense of grief and a certain sense of having you know lost something or left something behind and actually when you start to think about it logically there will always be part of me that's an athlete no one will ever take away my experiences or my accolades or any of the things that I've done in sport and actually there's quite a lot of comfort in knowing and recognizing that um you know yes I am no longer a current athlete but a a part of me will always be an athlete and I will always be an Olympian I think that's that's something uh, really kind of tangible to hold on to you don't have to let go of it completely it will always be part of you know defining you in the future um so again that was a bit of a learning curve for, for me this year but it has been a little bit of a roller coaster of just kind of just kind of investigating those emotions and just kind of experiencing them and see, saying you know what's going on here why do I feel the way I do about certain things because it often doesn't doesn't quite make sense like the grief thing it doesn't quite make sense why we feel a certain way about a certain thing so um yeah it's been it's been an interesting 18 months but I'm definitely in a you know in a really really good place now and definitely starting to to come to terms with my sporting journey and with that transition into what I call the real world yeah and it is a story um that identity crisis that I think we do hear more and more about as athletes transition out of their sport to I suppose the, the real world life if, if that's fair to call it that um in terms of you recommending to athletes to maybe think ahead and think what they do afterwards what were you thinking when you were actually competing was there any part of your mind that was thinking post-retirement what you were going to do or were you just so in the moment that you almost neglected that thought process um, I think for for a lot of my career I was very much in the moment it's much easier to be in the moment because it's here and now and it's pressing and it's exciting and it's important. And actually there's still a little bit of a stigma in sport amongst athletes and performance staff, coaches, people like that as well, that if you're not 
focusing 100% on your sporting endeavours, then how can you ever stand up on the blocks or stand up to race and know that you've done absolutely everything you can? If 10% of your effort, energy, focus was placed elsewhere, then you you know that you haven't done all, the, all that you can at the end of the day. And that's absolutely, it's a fundamentally flawed approach. Um, and actually what we find now and what research tells us now is that athletes tend to be much more balanced mentally um, and it has, a, you know, it has a physical impact as well to actually have other interests on the side and have other things that are, um, that are going on so that you're not so caught up in, in the sporting world and you're not so caught up in, in the results and it doesn't become the be-all and end-all whether or not you win or lose a race. Um, but but it's a slow process to change a, a culture, and it's it's as I said, it's you know there are lots of coaches that still believe that way, but it's mainly athletes that believe that way that say I'm so focused, I'm so dedicated, I'm so committed to my cause that I don't have time to do anything else. Any downtime, I'm going to be thinking and focusing on how I can become better. Um, and actually, that attitude is probably fine for a little bit of time, but isn't sustainable long term. And inevitably leads to this point where athletes reach the end of a career when all, all careers in sport end at some point. Um, and, and as I said earlier, kind of feel just at a huge loss of what to do and where to go next. And I think it's also important to recognise that it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be traditional academia that you're focusing on the side. For lots of athletes, that is the case. They want to get a degree or something like that. But it doesn't have to be that. It can be other interests as well. I think in my sporting career, it was a mix of those things. I, I spent some time absolutely only focusing on sport. Um, and it's, it's almost, it almost produces a bit of a polarized result it makes the highs higher because you only focus on sport but it makes the lows much lower as well because you have nothing else so it's a it's a it's a very risky way of going about it I think um and and then I had times where I did focus on academia and, and getting kind of you know I was, I was very young on the team so I was still doing GCSEs and A-levels and things like that um and then courses later on as well um, and then I think for me later on in my career, it was more just an acknowledgement that I needed some kind of mental stimulation uh, on the side of my sport. So it was more just about researching and looking into things that I was interested in, doing something like a photography course, doing an in-design course, doing something that fit around training that meant I wasn't spending all day, every day, focusing and thinking about swimming and thinking about training. Um, but but yeah, it, it can be really hard to do it. And as I said, there is a bit of still a little bit of a stigma to get over within within sport that says no, your um, attention needs to be a hundred percent on your sporting endeavours. And it's just that's just not true. And it's probably not best for most athletes and their well being. Um, but but I like lots of athletes got caught up in that too. Um, so yeah, it, it, I had a, probably a mix of all of those things really of of focusing on sport and focusing on other things um if I went back and did it again I probably would try and um spend a bit more time investigating those other sides to my identity and finding out what else I felt passionate about um but but that's been the last year for me has been <laughs> going back to those things so um yeah it just was a little bit delayed it's, it's one of those that's easier said than done I think in, in terms of finding that right balance for yeah for your mind, absolutely essentially. Um, I mean, Absolutely. you mentioned at the start as well, sort of that struggling to find the motivation for things. And I, I presume that almost seeped into sort of every part of your life as well. Um, but how easy is it to get that motivation back? Because like you said, it's taking the best part of a, of a year really to get into a good place. Yeah, for me, it's been about finding a routine that works for me. Um, so I think it's it's weird when you come out of sport when you've had such a regimented existence for so long. Um, you know, somebody, a coach or a performance staff or even, you know, off my own back has given me a program, a training program, a nutrition program, a strength and conditioning program, a psychological program. I've had a competition schedule every single year from the age of probably 
10 or 11. I've known when those definitive times are in the year that I need to be performing. Um, and the season has been geared towards those times. I've, I've known what I need to eat, what I'm not, you know, not allowed to eat or shouldn't be eating. I've known exactly which parts of my psychology are, are weaker than others and which parts I need to work. on. I've known when I need to have time off or when I should be having time off and when it's heavy winter season and I'm putting it all into winter training. So to not have that knowledge about your routine and to suddenly be back to having blank weeks or blank months in the diary, in theory, sounds incredibly liberating, but in reality is incredibly daunting. Um, so I think that, you know, that probably led to those first few months of me feeling a little bit like I was on holiday, being like, woohoo, no one's telling me what to do. Um, but after that, it was actually really difficult to suddenly look at the week and say, I can do whatever I want, but I don't know what to do. I don't even know where to start. And I didn't have any goals. I didn't have any objectives. I didn't have any um, metrics to know whether I was performing, whether I was succeeding in something, whether I was improving, whether I was growing, whether I was developing in all these different pursuits that I was doing because they weren't black and white like sport. They weren't, you know, it wasn't a case of going to the gym week after week and saying, oh, I can tell that I'm getting stronger in the gym because the numbers say that I'm getting stronger in the gym. This was doing things like, public speaking it was going into meetings it was practicing sales it was doing various different things that I'd never done before but I had no gauge of whether or not I was improving or whether or not I wasn't um and and I was getting feedback from people that wasn't as reliable as it probably had been in sport and that was very different and that hugely affected my motivation because instead of having these really um, kind of clearly defined goals and objectives and ways of improving and and um you know every single day every single session there was some objective something to get out of it with very very clearly defined metrics of whether or not you were achieving that I suddenly didn't have that at all so it was very hard to feel motivated about anything that I was doing because I didn't have anything that was saying hey you're on the right track here yeah, you're looking for a season's best right now. Hey, you're on track to break a world record. Whatever it is, you suddenly didn't have any of those things. Um, and it took a long time to start to create that for myself, to give myself the the metrics or, to, or the measurements throughout each of these skill sets or tasks or competencies or whatever I was doing to say, hey, that was actually really good. Actually, that was great because you put yourself out of your comfort zone. Hey, that didn't go so well, but there's a really important learning factor from that that I'm going to take into the next thing. And to actually create some routines around, you know, monitoring those things that I was doing, those roles that I had um, throughout the week or throughout the months to say, this is how I'm on track. This is how I know I'm on track. This is what I'm going to do to adjust it if I'm not on track. That's really important to feel like, you know, you're responsible for what you're doing and you're in control and you've got autonomy, but also for motivation as well to actually just feel like you're progressing towards something, which I didn't feel for quite a long time. Um, so, so yeah, it was a bit of a, a bit of a catch 22, really, because you, you, you feel great about having this freedom and you feel liberated and you feel like, thank goodness, I'm free from the, the shackles of having to train on bank holiday Mondays, of having to get up every Saturday morning at 5.30 or 6 a.m. and go training, of having to have my holiday at exactly the same time each year because that's how it is in the competition schedule. And and actually, and obviously that's, you know, huge positive and, and liberating, but on the flip side of that, of actually feeling quite lost and not having any gauge and measures of how you're doing, of how you're progressing, of what you're working towards, and realising that I had to take responsibility for that. Nobody else, I didn't have a coach anymore. Nobody else was going to sit there and say, this is what we're aiming towards. It's on this day. You have to go this time to know that you've succeeded in your task. And we're going to use these markers, these benchmarks throughout the season to know that we're on track for that. That's sport. It's very black and white. It's very simple. And actually, I didn't have that anymore. So I had to start creating that for myself. But initially, I just felt very lost <laughs> and felt very kind of, you know, daunted looking in a diary that didn't have anything in it. Um, so that was a real a real learning curve for me was to start creating that. But as soon as I did start creating that and as soon as I did start putting those benchmarks in place or those metrics in place, I started to feel motivation again. 
Um, and it was slightly different motivation to how I'd felt before because the motivation I'd felt in my sporting career was so defined on one thing. It was so focused on one achievement at the end of each season, whatever it was, or even the end of each four-year period with obviously an Olympic Games. It was so um, focused on that, whereas now I felt motivated in slightly probably lesser extents, but on various different things. Um, and actually, that that's also fine. That's also really good. Um, it was just different to what I was used to. Um, so yeah, it was it was definitely a learning curve for me. I think the main the key learning for me was to take responsibility of my own motivation and take responsibility of my own goals and objectives. I, I didn't have a coach that was doing it for me anymore. Um, and I had to take responsibility of saying, this is what I want to get out of this day, this meeting, this week, this month, whatever, in whatever capacity. Um, and as soon as I started to do that, I started to feel motivated again. Exactly. Um, so if I was to ask then, who is Lizzie Simmons now? What would the answer to that be? <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't ask that. <laughs> I like to throw um, a rogue one in every now and again. Yeah, it's a tricky question. I mean, I, I can't, I can't shy away from what I said earlier. I'm still there's still a part of me that is an athlete. Um, I'm still an Olympian. There's, no, you know, I'll never leave that behind. Um, that still defines a lot of what I do on a day to day basis. A lot of the roles that I'm doing at the moment are. Um, uh, with a view to link sport and, and elite sport, especially to other arenas and, and help other people kind of use the techniques and systems and habits that athletes create to affect their own performance and their own well-being. Um, so, so yeah, I will always be an athlete. I was all, always be an Olympian. Um, I think when you go back to basics, you, you, you go back to things like family. You know, I'm, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister. Um, you know, I'm a partner to somebody. It's you go back to I'm a, I'm friends to lots and lots of people. Um, I, in terms of the roles that I'm doing at the moment, I am a number of things. I am a coach. I'm a leader. Um, I am a, a mentor. Um, I'm vice chair of a of a athlete representative group um, for the British Olympic Association. Um, I'm a blogger. I'm a writer. Um, I did lots and lots of different things. Lots of yeah, yeah tons lots of, of identities. Things. It's, yeah. it's hard to, but actually, that's a it's a really good exercise to do for athletes because once you start looking at it like that, you know, if you've got a Twitter account, you're an influencer. It doesn't matter if you've got ten followers or ten million followers, you are an influencer. So that's one that you put on there. So to just actually go through it, that exercise and take it all the way back to basics, all the way. To, to family, to friends, to things that you're interested in. You know, I'm a, I'm a chef, I'm a baker, I'm an influencer, I'm a blogger, I'm a vlogger. Um, what, whatever you do, it starts. you start to build this well-rounded identity instead of just, I am an athlete. And if that's taken away from me, then I'm nothing, which is a really, really scary prospect. Um, but actually, when you realise that actually, I, yeah, I'm an athlete and I'm a, I'm a focused athlete, but that's just one part of who I am, then it becomes a lot less scary to think about losing that. Um, so, so yeah, I like everybody really, um, many, many different things. Make sure you follow Sportspiel on social media. Search for Sportspiel Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or on LinkedIn. The Twitter side yeah, of things absolutely. also brings me kind of perfectly onto the next topic I really wanted to delve into, because um, through blogging and through interacting on social media, there's a lot of positives that come from it, uh, but there's the pitfalls as well. And I think back to that tweet uh, in March 2018, I think it was now, um, it's still your pin tweet as well on your profile. <laughs> um, I found it funny when I first read it um, at the time, um, but others didn't exactly take it that way. Um, and it was that tweet where you basically recalled a lady at a public pool telling you that you should take up swimming seriously. Um, and then when you said you'd been to two Olympics, you thought you went as a spectator like she had. Um, yeah. But then off the back of that, because obviously some people didn't take that in the right way. Was that a very eye opening experience, really, to the social media landscape or 
the, per- the perceptions of people, really. Absolutely. That was one of the most surreal experiences I have ever had in my life. Um, so, yeah, as I said, as you said, it was a, a very kind of innocuous interaction with a lovely old lady. I was, I was training in a public session for irrelevant reasons but I was an elite athlete at the time but I was I had to do a session in the in the public um lanes they were very quiet lanes and I was just plodding along by myself in the in the fast lane and this lovely lady told me she leant over the lane rep and said you're really you're a really good swimmer um you're really good swimmer you know and I said oh, oh thank you and uh, and she said no no you should you should go and do like a trial or something with the county club and I, I was kind of like, oh, this is this is really awkward, and uh, and very British about it. I was like, oh, oh, I've act- I've actually been to two Olympics, and she completely misunderstood that, and was delighted, and said, oh, that's fantastic. Me too. Which sports did you manage to get tickets for? Which was obviously hilarious. I laughed about it. Um, I considered just making up some sports just to invo- avoid my embarrassment. Um, but ended up telling her that I had in fact competed at two Olympic Games and she was really embarrassed and we kind of had a bit of a giggle about it and I said, No, like there's no you know, no need to apologise or be embarrassed about it. I'm not a recognisable person unless you're, you know, really into swimming. And um, so it wasn't like she should have recognized recognised me or anything like that. Um, and it was a, a very awkward British conversation that I decided to recall later on Twitter. And I jammed it into 280 characters, as you do, um, and then sent it out to the world. And I went back online a couple of hours later, and my Twitter was incredibly slow to load, and I, I didn't really know why until I went onto the tweet, and it had something like 30,000 likes already. This was a couple of hours in. And I was kind of a bit gobsmacked, really. I'd never had anywhere near that much kind of interaction or engagement on social media. Um, I think I have about 20,000 followers on Twitter or just under at the time. Um, and I, I, you know, had no, no idea that it was going to kind of go viral so quickly. And most of the people that were reading the tweet were really tickled by it, really kind of laughing about it, really amused by it. They were saying, I've shared this with my swimming club or my family or my friends or whatever. So I was, re- I was really kind of pleased that they were, they were also amused by it. And then I logged back in a couple of hours later and it had got to 60,000 or something. And I noticed that Piers Morgan had retweeted it. And that's when things started to go a little bit wrong for me because I think a lot of his followers are American. So it, he effectively jumped the tweet across the pond into the hands of people like ESPN. So ESPN then decided that they would put it on their um, social media as their kind of like pinned tweet for that morning. ESPN have got, you know, millions of followers uh, most of them not olympic sport fans most of them kind of you you know your, your standard baseball basketball kind of american football fans so that's when things started to get quite nasty and the comments turned from being really you know really nice this was hilarious um this is a great conversation kind of thing to lots and lots of very unsolicited sexism. Lots of people saying we don't care about Olympic sport. Um, lots of same people saying we don't care about female sport. Um, lots of athletes, uh, sorry, lots of people saying it's unbelievable how arrogant you athletes are. You know, why did you expect this lady to know who you were? Which was completely not the intention of the tweet and not my intention of my interaction with her either because I, you know, I'm, I'm never recognised. I don't get recognised walking down the street or anything like that. So I had no intention that she should know who who I was. Um, and it was it was a really interesting kind of lesson, really, that things got quite nasty and I, I, I started trying to reply to people and trying to justify things and then realised that most of them were your classic kind of keyboard warriors just looking for a fight, really, and it really wasn't worth my while to, to respond to them. Um, I, I, you know, posted a, a couple more tweets about how things had kind of got a bit out of hand and how people had started being pretty mean about it, and lots of people then jumped to my defence, mainly from the UK, and said, you know, this has been taken completely out of context, you know, American humour is slightly different to British humour, which is very self-deprecating, very sarcastic, very kind of awkward humour that we have over here that, it, that, you know, it didn't quite translate maybe across to America that well. So I had lots of people defending it and, and saying, you know, it was 
I was in my rights to, to post it and they didn't read it like the Americans had read it and things like that. So um, it was a really interesting experience. It kind of went from initial hilarity to this, you know, vulgar kind of experience of people shouting abuse at me and, and saying horrible things about me that, um, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a, a bit of a whirlwind of kind of the power of social media, I guess. Um, and I often get asked to talk to young people about social media it's obviously, you know, hugely prevalent with today's youth. Um, and, I, and I do get asked to kind of um, talk to them about my experiences with it and about the lessons that I've learned from that experience. And I think the, the key thing was for me is that things are very easily taken out of context on social media. Um, and and that's, that did happen in my tweet. People read it in a different way to the way that I heard it in my head when I was writing it. So that's, you know, one of the key lessons. And another thing which I think a lot of people often need to remember is that as soon as you put something online, it's it's there forever. You know, even if you delete it later on, it's not really posting. It's more like publishing something. Um, and I think, you know, just to have a, almost just to have a five second word with yourself before you post anything online you know a video a, a picture a, a post a comment a thought um is to almost just say is this the way I want the world to see me a right now but b in five years time 10 years time 20 years time because there's a very very good chance that it this will be you know pulled out of the internet some at some point in the future and somebody will be judging me on that and it's not a I think social media is a fantastic thing it's done it's done wonders for connectivity and I think young people have, you know, un, unparalleled opportunities with, with social media and things like that. And it, for athletes especially, it's never been easier to, to market yourself to sponsors, to bring value to sponsors because instead of having to be there for appearances and things like that, you can now blog for them, you can tweet for them, you can put pictures up, you can, you've can you got a, a, a following that they can now access through you. Um, and that's really valuable for sponsors. So it's a brilliant thing for athletes and other young people alike. Um, but it's just a kind of, you know, a, a word of caution that I that I usually kind of ascribe social media and um, and yeah, and, and using it with with a little bit of caution, and a little bit of, of forethought. Exactly. Without without it, I mean, there's obviously the downsides, but without social media, I mean, people wouldn't know this podcast existed when we first started two years ago. So like I say, it's got the positives and the, the connectivity side of things. Uh, but when you maybe started looking about blogging more, connecting more, particularly after the retirement as well, did that experience sort of make you hesitant in any way? Because I suppose opening up on some of the topics that you have opened up about is quite a daunting thing for a lot of people, whether that ever came into your mind at all. I think for me, the key thing... For, for me that came out of that experience that probably impacted me you know further on I think that you know the context thing and something being taken out of context I don't I don't write a lot that's particularly controversial so I don't think that much of you know much of that was necessarily a concern for me going forward but I think the the probably the most important thing that I started to realize after that point was that I was whether I liked it or not an influencer there were people following me there were young very young athletes following me there were parents following me there were coaches following me there were other athletes there were people in hundreds of different industries across the world following me whether I liked it or not kind of thing and actually what I put out there I had a responsibility with what I put out there and it's fine putting frivolous things out there and putting jokes out there and those kind of things. And I do that regularly as well. But when it, when it came to my writing, when it came to blogging, I felt like I had a responsibility to be honest about things. Um, because I think you read lots of stuff. And I think often when athletes are in, in the moment in sport, they almost put up barriers a little bit to say, I'm strong. I'm fine, everything's going well, because actually you don't really want to show weakness in sport. There's, there won't be many athletes that are kind of saying, actually, I'm really struggling at the moment, leading into, for example, an Olympic Games, because that's potentially ammunition for comp you know competitors to say, oh, they're not in the right place. That's, you know, that's them ruled out kind of thing. So I think most athletes are fairly guarded about what's going on behind the scenes. And I probably was as well. Um, and I think... 
I recognised that I had a responsibility to be honest about my experiences, to be honest about my challenges, to be honest about the way that, you know, the solutions that I developed to, to help me with those challenges with a view that if it was something that I'd struggled with, the reality was or the expectation was that probably other people had as well. Um, and I think that, you know, there comes a certain amount of power with that to say, actually, I can use even the most challenging parts of my career as lessons that could help other people. And that wasn't something that I consciously considered when I started writing this blog, really. Um, but it's definitely something that I think about now. Um, and actually, you know, when we go back to motivation and things like that, that is a real motivating factor. Um, because some sport, some parts of sport are really hard. And definitely some parts of transition are really hard. So unless you're going to help other people, you know, why really share those those things around? Um, so I always do it with a view of this is my experience. This is this was the good bit about it. This was the bit that I struggled with. But actually, this is the way that I tried to make it better. And this is the way that I would recommend other people go about trying to make it better as well. Um, so it probably changed the process in the way that I wrote, you know, I didn't want to just write a monologue about how I was having a really awful time. I wanted to write something that was reflective and that was honest about the challenges I was facing or the struggles that I was having, but with a view that other people would probably be having those challenges so that it had to be in a proactive sense of these are the things that I think would really help you because they helped me. Um, so, so it's definitely, yeah, it's, it, it was an understanding that I had a responsibility and I had a duty to ensure that the content that I was producing was done in the right way. Um, and, uh, and I think, as I said, that has definitely been a motivating factor and it's definitely shaped the process that I go through when I write the blogs. Um, I don't just, I try not to just you know, have a outpouring of emotion or just talk about an experience, I always try to be reflective and say, this is what really helped in the situation. And this is what I would recommend for other people who are going through the same kind of situation. And reading the blog as well, I mean, the, the insightfulness, the reflectiveness certainly comes across for me going through it as well. And, and like you say, there's, you. there's often a lot of times where people can put their guard up in sport, which I suppose is maybe one of the main reasons we do this podcast anyway, because it's it's a chance for athletes to be reflective um, uh, when, when chatting to us. Uh, one more topic I'll mention um, post-retirement, uh, and that's the relationship with um, seeing your body change and food as well. Again, something you've talked about. Um, again, does that take time for you to adjust to? Um, and particularly... Um, when you've trained so regimentally and so hard throughout most of your life and then suddenly stopping that um, and coming to terms with the changes your body is, is coming under. And I know you've mentioned in the past as well sort of how it's not the main focus, but sometimes there's a lot of body judgment that does go on um, when you are actually competing and coming to terms with that still as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really, it's a really important po point. And I think there's... Um, there are a few different things. I think there's there's um the there should be interest in kind of how athletes currently competing athletes manage this as well. Um and it is a you know, it is a real challenge in sport. You you tend to be more successful with a certain body composition, or that's at least the perception on the outside. So there can be a lot of pressure to, you know, adapt to a certain weight or a certain body composition or, or whatever it might be and I think there's maybe not quite enough done to support athletes through that process um, and to make sure actually that athletes are okay psychologically as well as physically when it when it comes to those kind of things um, and then obviously when when coming out of, of sport an athlete's relationship with food with exercise with their body is going to change quite significantly, especially if, like me, you've been doing this for the majority of your life. You know, I started when I was kind of early, early teens training at this level. So I've only really ever known myself to be kind of strong and lean with an athletic build because that's how I've always been. 
Um, and even when I've taken time off, it's not significantly, you know, changed my body or the way I've looked or anything like that. And I think lots of athletes, when they come out of sport, that they're, they're very, very conscious of how their body is changing, whether that's putting on a bit of weight, whether it's losing muscle mass, whatever it is, you're not doing the same demanding um, training that you've been doing for the last 5, 10, 15 years. So your body is going to change. Um, and there isn't much really to prepare you for that, especially if you've never really experienced it. So it can be quite daunting and it can be quite... Um, it can be quite harrowing to, I guess, look in the mirror or to get on the scales and notice that things are changing and not really want them to change. You know, you want to, you want to, even though if you're not doing the same demanding exercise, you want to stay lean, you want to stay fit, you want to stay, um, you know, muscular or whatever it is, but that's not really the reality of, of coming out of sport. So um, I think, I think there's, and, and the other thing is, is athletes have a very, direct relationship with food and nutrition when you're fueling every single thing you're doing and it has such an impact on performance and recovery food and nutrition is a massive massive part of every athlete's life and not that food isn't a massive part of other people's lives but it's not going to have quite such an impact as it would with an athlete who may have even been you know to the extent of calorie counting or been giving a nutrition plan know exactly how much protein they're wanting to have after a training session know exactly how much carbohydrate they need to be having before during and after a race whatever it is athletes are very good at knowing that so again it's one of those where it seems quite liberating to leave all that behind to suddenly be able to say hey i want a burger and that's fine but in reality it can be a bit daunting again um to to be at meal times and say what you know what do i now need to eat for the demands of my life because the demands of my life are very different physically to what they were a year ago or 18 months ago or 10 years ago um and and often athletes won't prepare for that. it's quite hard to prepare for that so um i think the the key thing for me and and again it, this isn't something i realized straight away but it's kind of happened over the past 18 months is that a, you know, it's okay for our bodies to change. B, no, no one else cares as much as you do about your body and about things changing. So we think that by putting on a bit of weight or by losing a bit of muscle mass, that that somehow makes us less valuable as a person or it somehow undoes or discredits the wonderful things that we've done in sport. And that's just not true most people around us barely even notice most of the people around us wouldn't you know wouldn't notice any difference in me if I'm one or two kilograms more than I am now but I would notice a huge difference and I wouldn't be okay with that so I think to recognize that that this is you know it's, it's not your problem but it's it's your insecurity and it's nobody else's judgment and actually it's just you know you that needs to come to terms that you have to prove yourself to anybody by having an eight pack or by having massive biceps or by having a really, really low skin fold. And actually the priority when you're out of sport is to be healthy, is to be fit and it's to be exercising still. And I wrote another blog on exercise and why it was so, so important that athletes don't just stop as much mentally as physically. Um, but so it's important to be healthy. It's important to be fit um, and you know generally generally well. Um, but the most important thing is to be happy and and to be content with what you're doing. And it's not to have you know defined abs and it's not to have a certain skin fold or a certain body weight or a certain body composition anymore. And that doesn't have to define you anymore. Um, and when you realize that it's actually quite nice to be able to let go of that and to say it doesn't matter what my weight is each morning it doesn't matter what I can lift in the gym anymore I'm not being judged on that I'm being judged on certain different things it's my interaction with other people it's my attitude and application to the things that I'm doing at the moment um, so for me it was really important to kind of set some expectations set some kind of you know, my body is going to change and it might be hard, but that's okay. Um, and my relationship with food is going to change and with exercise is going to change and that's also okay. Um, and then to, to just start to think about, you know, if I'm not judging myself on my body composition, my performance in the gym, my swimming times, my 
weight in the morning, then what am I judging myself on each day? Because you automatically want to, you know, we're used to having these gauges of knowing where, where we are and how we're doing with things. And we use them as a marker of confidence and a marker for motivation. And it's okay to let go of obviously the ones that, you know, you had in sport and those ones to do with body composition or to do with performance. But if you're going to let go of those, you need to have some replacements. So it's almost setting some values for yourself for the day or for the month or for the week or whatever it is to say, well, this is what I am judging myself on. Um, And so I, you know, I, I listed some of those and I think, you know, one of mine was bringing value to other people through kind of sharing my sporting experiences. Uh, another was around challenging myself each week, so pushing myself outside of my of my comfort zone of having you know things that I'd never done before. Another one for me was giving myself permission to enjoy kind of interaction with other people, to enjoy social time, to enjoy being around friends without the pressure of having to know you've got to go to training the next morning, to give my, really give myself permission to enjoy that. Um, to Another one of mine, I think, was committing to kind of learning from people who have very different experiences and challenges from me because I've been in quite a, um, you know, quite a blinkered existence in the world of elite sport for a long time. So to actually embrace other people who had different challenges and different experiences in the world um to be creative to be you know apply myself fully to the things that I was doing so all of those things are are genuine you know healthy measures of how you're doing on any one day and if you've got a a positive healthy set of those things then it becomes less important what you weigh in the in the morning or how much you can lift in the gym or how fast your time is in the pool or you know whatever it is whatever you're you know you're you're stuck judging yourself on um so I think it's really important to take some time to do that but it wasn't again this isn't something that I necessarily learned immediately it's taken me time to come to terms with this and time to kind of create those values and um and those kind of principles for myself um and those measures of how i you know i do feel comfortable judging myself on those things um and that's really really important listeners did you know sportspiel is partners with the mintridge foundation this fantastic charity was founded back in 2015 by managing director alex wallace You might remember she was a guest on this podcast shortly before she won the Sunday Times Sportswoman of the Year Grassroots Award back in 2018. But what do they do? Well, the charity is all about using life experiences to promote an active lifestyle for children and young people using the power of sporting role models to help. The foundation has a community of 31 elite sports people working as ambassadors on each of the Mintridge Foundation's programmes. They work with schools, colleges, universities, clubs and associations, but more importantly, they help change young lives. You might even have heard some of their ambassadors on this very show. Danielle Brown and Shona McAllen are just two of them, and you can hear them talk about the work they do with Mintridge in their respective interviews. So if you want to find out more, support the charity, or get involved, then check out their website, www.mintridgefoundation.org.uk That's www.mintridgefoundation.org.uk um, But we'll turn back the clock now uh, and look at your career as well. Um, I mean, first off, I'll, I'll start right at the beginning and, and say why why was it swimming in the first place? What was it about that particular sport that sort of that, that grabbed you in the first place? I was just awful at all the other ones, I think. Which is a, which is a fair <laughs> response. Um, no, I think for some reason I loved the water ever since I was, you know, a tiny, tiny baby. I think my parents just had to put me in some form of water and I'd stop crying. Um, going on holidays as a, you know, I've got many, many pictures of me as a really, really young kid kind of just 
pottering around in in the water in pools and rock pools in the sea or whatever it was and I think I just felt an affinity with water so it was very easy for me to kind of sign up to the usual swimming lessons and go and progress through the ranks of a local club I apparently swam a mile when I was six so I was obviously pretty into it even by the age of six um and then I think you know at the age of nine or ten I started beating some of the older girls I started doing a bit of competition although I really struggled with competition because I was extremely anxious and nervous around competition um so I kind of you know I I loved and hated competition in equal measures I would cry a lot beforehand and then be really happy afterwards um so and and I, I think yeah I just I got hooked on swimming particularly so it was it was I think it was a mix of you know just being naturally enjoying being in the water and then obviously you know as soon as you start to see progression and results then it becomes more of a motivator for you to continue with it um and and yeah it was just something that I I really took to I did do other sports as a as a youngster just the kind of normal ones at school but none of them really um you know I really felt as passionate about as I did as as swimming so it was just always the one for me Mm -hmm. was that was the competing side of things something or was there something or a reason behind why you got anxious behind them um because even when I think back to when I used to compete in fencing and there were some competitions I I really liked doing and felt comfortable at those ones I did well at and then there was just others where for whatever reason anxieties kind of get hold of you a little bit so I think, I mean, I've done a, a lot of thinking about this because it's affected me later on in my career as well. And actually now I'm in a position that I'm out of sport where I mentor other young athletes who have similar anxieties and similar kind of um, beliefs around competition and similar get similarly nervous before competitions. And I think for me it was that I developed a what I'd call a, a kind of self-limiting belief that my worth as a person was correlated to my performance in the pool. And that didn't come from anybody else. I had a brilliant set of coaches and the most supportive family um, and parents. My parents were were brilliant and never put any pressure at all on me as a youngster. It was all, you know, you do what you want to do. We're fully behind you. We fully support you. But we are not invested in this more than you are. Um, so, you know, we support any decision that you make. And if, if any point you want to step away from this, we also fully support you. So it was the ideal kind of environment of support and network of support that a young athlete could ever ask for. But in my head, I think I probably built up a little bit of a belief that my my worth and, you know, who I was as a person was really entangled with the time on the clock or the medal that I won or the record that I broke. And that probably is quite common. It's common, especially with athletes who are successful at a young age because they don't experience much losing. Um, whereas if you get athletes that, you know, have quite a few races where they don't do that well and they don't break the records and they don't get into the rankings, they don't get on the podium, actually they start to recognise that, oh, I'm still the same person. I still, you know, I still have the same values. I my value as a person, my self-worth is not tied up in what I do in the pool. It's something separate um, from from me and my, you know, my personal identity. But I didn't have that. So I think, you know, going back to the, the talk about identities, my my identity as a person was very much intertwined with my identity as an athlete. And the problem with that is it, it's fine when things go really well, but it makes the consequences of losing or the consequences of perceived failure or the consequences of not doing as well as you wanted to do it makes those consequences catastrophic because suddenly your self-worth falls down as well your self-confidence um you know who you think you are as a person that also falls down with that now I was very successful as a young athlete so I didn't experience much of that but it meant that the worry and the anxiety around performance was that you know if I don't do well in this competition that means I'm a less worthy person that means you know I I can't be proud of myself it means other people aren't going to be proud of me and no one else was telling me this this was all in my own head but it but it became something that was it wasn't debilitating in the sense that I still was able to perform but it made the emotions around competition um 
probably above mm. average and heightened and a it became a, a you know a stressful ordeal and it became stressful for my parents as well to try and support me through that and so when I work with young athletes now it's something that you know I help them acknowledge and break down those beliefs and help them establish those two identities that are separate this is me as a person this is how I judge myself and value myself as a person and then this is me as an athlete and this is the performance that I do in the pool or on the track or on the pitch or whatever performance you're doing but they're separate things and I can be proud of myself and lose a race that so that is something that is valid and that's something that's acceptable whereas in my head when I was a youngster that wasn't something that I could do um so so yeah it's been it's something that I've reflected back on as I said it's not it wasn't uh, directed by anybody else it was purely something that I built up in my head but it is really common with athletes that are really successful from a from a young age and don't go through those usual kind of failure navigation um processes I guess is that come down to a um a self-confidence thing as well maybe I don't know whether it was about you as an entire person or were you so ingrained in sport that it was just the be all and end all sort of thing. Yeah, it was it was a weird one really. I don't think I I felt like internally I felt confident, I think, before before competitions. I knew I had the ability and the capacity to perform and do well. It was more the fact that I, I put so much pressure on doing well that even just the thought of not doing well was really 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 stressful for me so I don't know yeah it, it may have been a, a confidence thing um but I guess you know confidence is is tied up with that identity piece as well you know if you're confident in who you are aside from your sporting performance inside aside from your athletic endeavors and it makes it much easier to go into those high pressure high stress situations and say hey I'm going to do my absolute best here there are no guarantees in sport I'm going to do my best and I'm going to be you know proud of myself for doing my best no matter what the result is whereas that's probably not a process that I ever consciously went through as a young athlete it was more go into this competition hope for the hope for the best know that I could perform but be very, very fearful of underperforming. Um, so, so yeah, it's a, it was, it was an interesting. And I, I, and as an older athlete, I did start to unpick that um, and start to recognise that. But it definitely, as a young athlete, it was, it was something that was um, I found quite stressful. Well, yeah, when you've got that worry lurking in the background, um, do you think that affected some of your performances, um, or what, were the performances sort of? They just took care of themselves, really. Um, it probably, I think it, it probably affected my parents more than me. <laughs> they were stressed out. Yeah, they were stressed, obviously stressed okay. out as well. Um, I think you know, for me, once so I was a backstroker and did a you know did a lot of backstroke. When you swim in backstroke, you jump in the pool before you start. Obviously, you do it. You start from the water. But even just getting on the block in other events as well, my kind of nerves and anxiety as soon as I got there left me completely. So I don't think it affected my performance to a huge degree, but it definitely affected my um, preparation for those performances. Um, and I would almost try and avoid even thinking about big competitions and stuff like that because it was too kind of it made me too anxious to think about it and to acknowledge that it was coming up and that I was going to have to you know deal with it in a week's time or a month's time or whatever it was so yeah it was more the the preparation towards it and uh, you know I loved swimming and I loved training and I was having a great time as well you know it wasn't all anxiety and stress it just um it was just you know in the very close lead up to to competitions especially when I started to compete at things like um district level and national level um it you know where races are a bit tighter and you stop winning by such big margins it was it was something that was on my mind but um yeah it was it was a weird one I think it's definitely it you know it was obviously hard at the time but it, I think it probably also shaped me and and helped me become more resilient because I knew then that I could perform with those doubts as well I could perform when I wasn't feeling confident I could perform 
when um you know I, I was struggling with things or did feel anxious or did feel nervous so in a in a sense it was you know it, it did become probably a positive for me as well because um I, I, I as I went through my career I started to create a belief of you know no matter what my head's telling me I know that I can perform at the end of the day because I had lots of experience doing that and actually that's quite a um reassuring thing when you're going into big competitions and major competitions later on is yes my you know my head's going to be all over the place and I'm going to have nerves and I'm going to be thinking about consequences and I'm going to have worries about this competition but I know that I can perform you know no matter what my head's saying um so so yeah it wasn't it wasn't all it wasn't all challenge and I'm I, I I'm a real kind of true believer that all of our experiences um you know shape the way that we go through life and shape the kind of beliefs and identities that we create as we as we do progress through so um I don't yeah it's it's not something that I you know regret not understanding that when I was younger um it's just interesting to look back and think about some of the things that I might have been thinking as as a young athlete and uh, and it's it you know I'm in a pr- privileged position now to be able to mentor other young athletes with the hindsight and with the perspective that I have now to say hey you know I, I had exactly the same mindset as you and I had exactly the same struggles and anxieties that you have um but I also now know some things that are really going to help you out and it's quite nice to be able to see those really take effect with with other young people um and to give them that kind of messaging that I maybe didn't get when I was a youngster definitely and like you say it makes you stronger as well um, and I listed, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, listed off the, the, a bunch of accolades at the start. Um, but I, is there any moment that serves as a particular highlight for you or a moment that you really remember fondly from swimming days? Um, I mean, the, the been, there have been many over the years. Um, I think in terms of actual performance and, and you know, getting on the podium and having the national anthem play being european champion is it was a pretty special one for me um it was out in budapest it was one of the last outdoor major competitions so the sun was shining my parents were in the crowd it was kind of not a party atmosphere but it was very loud the crowd were all going crazy and it was a real you know the the hungarians really really love love swimming and it was really kind of great competition um and that was so that was definitely a very special memory for me um, in terms of just overall experience, it would have to be the London Olympics. I think for, for any athlete to go to a, an Olympic Games is something pretty special. But to be fortunate to kind of coincide the peak of your career with the home games is something that only really now looking back do I recognise how fortunate I've been to, to do that. Um, and I'd been to, you know, I'd been to Beijing four years earlier as a, as a young athlete. I think from memory in Beijing, there were probably about seven British people in the crowd. Um, my, my parents had decided not to go because they didn't fancy China as a summer holiday. Cheers, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, you know, fast forward four years and we were at the London Olympics. And I'm sure you remember and most people remember. But as a nation, we just kind of went Olympics mad. Um, and like in the in the lead up the whole of that year, really, in the lead up to that, it was just kind of, yeah, as a nation, we just had Olympic fever. Um, I think the hardest part for me, I was saying to, to somebody the other day, the hardest part for me of that whole year was the Olympic trials because I couldn't imagine not being on that team. Um, and I think I remember saying to my mum at the time that if I'd not made the team, I would have had to just leave the country that summer for like two months just to get just to get away from it because I, I don't. I think it would have been really really hard to kind of know you just missed out and and not made it onto the team. But luckily, I did make it on, um, and it was kind of everything it you know it was lived up to be um it was the atmosphere and this the stadium uh walking out to kind of twenty thousand people but most of them were british and most of them were kind of screaming my name because it was a home games and they're all cheering for me is just an experience it's, it's quite kind of hard to kind of adequately put it into words um and yeah it's just it's something that as i said really it's only really through coming out of sport that I really kind of truly recognise how fortunate I've been to be in that position um and it was obviously you know it was a it was 
a mix of emotions for me at that competition because I came fourth, which is obviously pretty close to coming home with a medal, but I didn't quite manage to. So um, it was definitely a, an up and down couple of weeks. But just looking back now, I just feel kind of so privileged to have even been in that position and be a British athlete competing at, at those games. And um, and and yeah, and the as a kind of follow up from that, the I think the legacy that those games created is something that's um still having huge impact now so I think not so long ago and definitely within within my career on British teams we were kind of nowhere really as a nation in in medal tables and things um and now I think we tend to punch kind of way way above our weight in terms of medals and success as a nation I think a lot of that was inspired by London either from young athletes who were there as their first games and then have gone on to do great, great things or from actually, you know, athletes who were still sitting on their sofas as wide-eyed 10-year-olds or 15-year-olds who are who are now kind of on the scene and, and now representing Britain. And I think um, the, the Games did something very, very special for our country. It brought many, many people together from different backgrounds, different cultures, different political size etc etc and that's um I guess the yeah the power of sport but it was very very obvious when it was you know on a on home soil um and it yeah very special to have been a part of that um that brings me on perfectly then to my final couple of questions which is entitled on my notes the power of sport and it's kind of where your role as an ambassador for the Minchish Foundation comes in as well um bearing in mind everything we've talked about how important is sport particularly for young people who may be looking for that identity or may be dealing with those anxieties that you had at competition, but maybe their own ones manifest themselves in, in different ways? Yeah, I think, uh, um, we, you know, I've worked with the Minshews Foundation for a couple of years and they're obviously doing some, some brilliant, brilliant work with with young people who face, you know, a variety of different challenges ranging from, you know, disabilities or, um, uh, you know, coming from, from backgrounds that, um, are unprivileged backgrounds or actually, you know, just being part of, um, you know, part of being a, a young person is, is challenging at the moment. Um, and I think we've noticed through working with the organization and they've obviously noticed having, having the foundation, the, the power of sport in just uniting young people together, regardless of background, regardless of race, regardless of culture, regardless of ability or disability, regardless of gender, of just bringing people together for fun, for enjoyment, for competition, for challenge, for setting goals, for having aspirations. Um, and I think, it, you know, in that sense, sport truly does become universal um and i i think it's so crucial that organizations such as mentors continue to do the work that they do because it it can be such a powerful force in young people's lives especially for those who maybe aren't particularly active at the moment you know to to suddenly start doing a few different activities or a few different sports and it doesn't have to be for competition it doesn't have to be to to be an athlete or to win medals or to do any of that but to purely you know go out in the park or go and play football at lunchtime or go and and swim at the weekends or what, whatever it is to to just bring young people together and then you know that kind of cascades upwards I think as well because as a as a nation we're also fairly divided at the moment there are lots of different things going on that people have very um specific opinions on or very um you know differing opinions on what's going on at the moment and I think again with something like the Olympics around the corner sport brings people together because no matter what your position on Brexit, no matter what your um, thoughts on Donald Trump or climate change or, um, you know, race or ethnicity or gender or culture or whatever it is, next year Britain will unite to support Great Britain at the Olympic Games. And there's something incredible about that, um, something really, really cool about the fact that you know, it transcends all of those other issues, transcends all of those divisions that we might have as a country. So I think it's so important for for young people to establish habits and routines that include activity and include sport. And obviously from a physical sense and for health and for all of those benefits that we know sport and activity gives young people, but also just for the social factor and for the um, 
for the pure pleasure of interacting with other people, not to cause divisions, not to have different opinions, but for competition and enjoyment and, and fun. Um, and, and that's something that we, we occasionally lose sight of. Um, but I do, do believe that sport has the power to, to bring people back together. And it'll be brilliant to kind of watch, I guess, the games go next year and see a whole new generation of people inspired, of young people inspired, whether that's, you know, six, seven-year-olds who have never watched the games before, don't remember a games happening before, or whether it's 13, 14, 15, 16-year-olds who are hoping to maybe go to the next games or the one after that. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a pretty special thing. Again, it's not something that I really thought about when I was competing. Um, I didn't really recognise the kind of the true power of sport. It was just something that I did. Um, but actually now it's it's great to re-engage with sport in different capacities, whether that's with high performance sport, with some of my roles, which are uh, to do with Team GB and supporting um, high level elite athletes, or whether it's actually going all the way back to grassroots with something like the Mintridge Foundation supporting young people. And as you say, taking experiences from something like elite sport, but actually, you know, they're human experiences and they can be shared with young people. And, you know, everybody gets nervous about something. So if I can help with the techniques and tactics that I use throughout my career to help young people develop their own systems of managing their nerves and their anxieties and their stress and the you know the pressure that they feel as young people then that's really valuable exactly a lot of um perfect messages there where we can get behind and like i say there's a lot of transferable skills from sport to uh everyday life as well and whatever problems someone may have um, we see it firsthand ourselves the power that sport can actually have and with that i'll bring this particular interview Uh, to an end on the podcast thank you once again Lizzie for coming on Um, I think that's probably one of the most wide ranging interviews we've had on this podcast Um, again lots of important messages across the board really and really uh, hope that everything goes well with your various different roles at the moment because there's a lot going on and likewise we look forward to Tokyo 2020 when it comes around because like I say we all go Olympic mad when the games are on Um, But for now, thank you so much for coming on, Lizzie. No problem at all. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, uh, yeah, it's been really, really good to discuss some of my experiences. um, And and yeah, look forward to, to next year and the future. Thank you once again to Lizzie for taking time out to chat with us on the podcast. It's also an extended thank you to Alex Wallace and the Mintridge Foundation for helping to set up this interview. Definitely one of our most in-depth and insightful we've ever had. If you want to read Lizzie's blog, make sure you check it out at lizziesimmons.com. You don't have to wait long for the next episode of Sportspiel as we're going to be back tomorrow that's Monday, September 30th, for our September discussion episode, where we go through some of the biggest talking points in sport with some guest panellists. Tomorrow, myself and Will are joined by journalists Ollie Godden and Julia Cook to talk about the IAAF World Athletics Championships in Doha, body shaming on social media, and the latest twists and turns in the Russian doping saga. It also happens to be International Podcast Day on Monday, so that's even more reason to tune in. Make sure you follow Sportspiel on social media. Do give us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or the podcast platform of your choice. And be sure to spread the word to your friends. That's it for now. And until next time, listeners, we will see you very soon.